afternoon, and uh, sorry for all the changes in the schedule, as entirely my fault. Uh, well, it's mostly Caleb. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk to you about uh, probability and likelihood analysis, in particular for cosmology. Uh, and uh, also Benjamin Stoltzman, who's sitting here, will be helping you later in the All right, so um, let me just tell you what's the goal of this afternoon is. So the goal is to uh, get you up to speed with just the basics of life you analysis, and then you will write your own NCMC code and make your own mock data and Okay, so let's start. Um, basically, you're on your disk. You've probably seen it before. Um, so, but it's just conditional probability. You probably remember this from sometime in your education. Probability of A and B is probability A given B, probability A, probability B given A, probability B. So, why the fuss? Why is it appealing by itself? It's just rearranging this. Okay, so why the fuss? Um, it's more of a philosophical thing that um, makes it appealing by itself. Because otherwise, you're just writing conditional probability. Now, to demonstrate that, I'll give you this example. Um, so imagine you have an urn, like this one, and it has a lot of marbles in it. But you can't take all the marbles out of the urn and see all of them. And you can see through the urn even. But what you do is, uh, maybe there's someone else who can pick a handful of them and show you once in a while. So that would be kind of like our astronom uh, astronomical data. Now what you, what you don't know is how many marbles of different colors there are in the end. Um, but what you know is the color of that handful of marbles that you got. So what you want to know is what's in here. What you know is this. And that's why we write this zero as we do. So long if you think of frequentist approach, the um, the assumption is that the model is singular, so you know what the model is, so you know what's in there. And you're trying to see what are the different realizations of data you can get if you know what's in here. Okay? Uh, but what we have in reality, especially in cosmology, is that we just have one universe, which is one realization of the underlying model, but what we want to understand is the model. Okay, so now let's rewrite the base theorem in this form so it makes it more clear why it's special. So this uh, is probability of data given model. So this would be the thing if you were if you knew what the model was, then you could see what are the different realizations you can get out of it. And this one which is called posterior is the probability of model given the data. And this is what we always want to know. So we want to know what's in there. Right? Uh, so now we can write it like this. So we have likelihood here, prior here, evidence here. And prior is basically our prior knowledge about the model which will come from different places. And we'll probably get into that a bit later. Okay, okay so. Um, we went through Bayes theorem, but let's go a step back to what is, how do you actually solve any problems in, that need statistics? Any uh, statistical questions, let's say. Uh, so there are quite a lot of steps, but the first two steps are the most important, especially the first step. You have to be able to phrase your question very carefully and really think about what your question is because that's usually the step that people miss and then uh, use the wrong method and then got the wrong result. I'm going to see an example. So, 
And then once you identify your question carefully, step two is just to find your appropriate statistical approach to answer that particular question. And then the rest of it is bookkeeping. And then there is it. Okay, so, so it's easy. Same with this one. It's the most, it's the most difficult option. All right, so let's look at an example. Imagine you've been called for jury duty. Um, you didn't expect it, that's why you look like this. Uh, okay, and the case is, it's actually a real case, but uh, because it's not really relevant to what we're doing, I'm not going to say who it is. Some of you might know who it is already. Uh, but it's a celebrity in a homicide case. And um, the case is that the defendant is accused of murdering his wife. And the evidence that you've been shown is some evidence like, I don't know, they found uh, a matching glove to the, uh, the defendant's glove in the scene that was bloody. Maybe they found some blood in his car, this sort of thing. So no DNA or like fingerprints that really connect them. Um, and, and we also know that the defendant has a history of violence against his wife. So this is like the evidence you got. And this, this is the defense case. So the defense case tells you that actually uh, this first one is circumstantial like body, glove, and so on. You could have been someone else's glove. Uh, and then the second one actually is not very statistically significant. They say that only one in a thousand abusive husbands eventually learns of Okay. So you have this evidence. Uh, how are you going to decide? So first, I'm going to give you one minute to think about this by yourself. Uh, and then uh, you discuss it in groups. One minute and discuss it. You think about it yourself. What are the points? What does that defense mean actually for this case? Right? So one minute starting now. By yourself. <laughs> You'll have time to discuss. It's just to give everyone time to think about it themselves. You can write things if you want. Can help you. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so, so you thought not guilty. Uh, why do you think that? Well, I think he, he for him it was obvious that, that he would be suspected of murder, yes. And uh, actually, during the long history of his uh, life with his wife, nothing happened. So he was uh, maybe has some violence, but uh, nothing such bad happened. So, so I would say in that direction. Okay. Did you did you hear that? In the back? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Alright, so someone who says guilty, can they say why they think that this person's guilty? Yep? I think it's because we are only looking at I mean from the defense's case there we've been stating, you know, what's the probability like you say one hundred thousand of being a wife in an abusive relationship? And being murdered, right? But this doesn't even take into account the general probability of being a wife and being murdered. Um, so you don't think of this as like an unnormalized probability. So one thing one takes into account, uh, then it could be a lot more likely okay. for it to actually be the victim of murder compared to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. it's not accounting for some other aspect. Exactly. Uh, anyone else wants to add anything to that? Like the fact that given your kill, which was the probability that was your abusive yeah. mm -hmm. husband, that's like, that is the way around the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, so this, if you notice, it goes back to posing your question carefully. Mm -hmm. What are you trying to answer? Are you trying to answer what's the probability of an abusive husband killing their wife? Is that what you're trying to answer? Or are you trying to answer something else? Does anyone want to suggest what the question should be? I was just thinking, I mean, the little question is the, the husband killed his wife or not, or whether it's like a person who was killed as himself. Okay. Mm -hmm. And was he one of the probable candidates of the mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody. Yeah. Okay. okay, so what would you like say if you want to pose the question uh, with respect to the husband, what would it be? So the question would be given the murder and given the damage that it's a bit harsh, how what is the probability that the husband has killed? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so they said that given that the wife was murdered and that the husband was abusive, yes. what's the probability that the husband killed her? So yes. that would be the question we pose. Uh, which is a different question to this one. Uh, this, this answer is a different question. Yes. Okay. okay, so what we're going to do now is... Uh, yeah. So that was the result of the jury game. Now we're going to try to actually uh, solve this probability question. Um, so, uh, first pose the question. So we said now what the question should be. Right now you want to like write it down in terms of probability. And then there's some additional information for you so you can actually calculate it. So, first one is the same one that you had. So 100,000 of these husbands and Wives. The second one is on average 5,000 women are murdered each year, and of these, 1,500 by their husbands. And then assume that the total population of women is 100 million in this experiment, in this scenario. And this is just a hint because you will probably need to use this chain. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now I'll give you five minutes to try to come up with something. And give me a number. Yes. Oh, so I think you're going to see the ocean. I think this 
that his wife is murdered and that he has a history of violence against his wife. Okay, and we need the other evidence behind for this. So, okay, we're gonna make these, uh, define these things. So, K, his husband kills his wife. NK means husband not kills his wife. So, it doesn't kill his wife. A, husband abused his wife, and wife is not. Okay? So, with this definition, this question comes into knowing this probability. So, probability of husband kills his wife, given that wife is murdered and husband abuses wife. Okay? So, this is what you want to find. The right, like, take a note. Have you taken a note of this because you need to use this chain? If you haven't, I just leave it here so you can be here for a few seconds. Thank 
murder by the rest of And there's one no, other one that's the death. And we're not going to use that to get back to the possibility of being in all these relationships. And we can go back to the first. And there's something like, yeah. Sorry, Wait, can we can we go back on slide again to the
and not a position. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that would be pretty cheap. So now, this is the probability of the husband this not, this is the part, for the wife not being murdered by the husband. Given the fact that it's a single. Yes, so that's the probability of. But then you should have to say my point that D given B is 9.99 and it's 99 and you go back to 1. But Yeah, I got some number. Yeah, what is it? Uh, ninety-six point six. Ah, uh -huh. does anyone else have number? I'm not gonna say this, but I'm not. <laughs> Are you close? How many number? Ish. Ish. Okay. Well, I'll give you another hint. This one, the A doesn't matter. It's kind of like this one, but the A doesn't. Yeah, 
22 seconds. Which is we 
specific to either the survey or this particular data. Um, and then in total we have something like 12 free parameters and we're trying to fit these 12 free parameters. Okay? And this is like an, an example of how we might fit these parameters. So you've probably seen this line of plots, it's come to the plots before. Uh, this is obviously not showing all the 12 parameters, just like a selection of them. And um, generally speaking, you have the one signal contours here, they are the darker ones, and then the two signal contours. And, um, and then you might have a best fit value as well, but we won't get into that right now, which is the dash lines. Now, um, the one day, based on I wrote at the start, we were trying to uh, find the posterior for the model given the data. But what actually we do normally is finding the posterior for the parameters of the model given the data and the model. So in this case it would be finding the param value of the parameters like sigma a, omega m and so on given that the data that we observed and the model that we fixed to find the same. So we're not this then it becomes in this format, and then we usually in, in simplify this to make it like this. So we just plot model because we fix the model anyway. Okay? And then here, uh, if you notice, I've also dropped evidence because that's just the normalization of the uh, distribution. And when we're doing this kind of contour analysis, we don't care about that, but we'll care about it later in the last session. So we can just write it as posterior uh, parameters given data is equal to posterior uh, probability of data given parameters and then a prior knowledge of what the uh, parameters are. Okay, uh, so when we do like an analysis we normally use a Gaussian distribution and the Gaussian distribution looks like this. And this is a one dimensional Gaussian distribution. Um, and if you kind of um, randomly draw from this distribution, it might look something like this histogram here. But be careful that when your a distribution is tending to a Gaussian, it tends faster to a Gaussian near the uh, mean of the Gaussian rather than the wings. So if you care about the wings for whatever reason, um, make sure that you have enough realizations or you're using the central limit theory with large enough uh, population to get the things going. For like an analysis, we don't care about the big that much. As you saw, we look at one signal to sigma, so it's fine. Okay, and then um, when you write, so this one here, this one was called likelihood, right? Mm -hmm. So likelihood is Normally, actually, written this way as well. So I mean, so kind of swap the data and model. So it would be likely good of uh, data given the model, but it's written like this. I mean, it's a historic thing, but it's equal to probability of data given the model. Um, and then here you can see that the model here. Now we're not just putting the parameters; we're also putting the model for the data. So that red line that I showed you, which is not the parameters itself, but it depends on the parameters. And then if we write a multivariate Gaussian likelihood, it looks like this. I'm going to tell you what each of these components are before we continue to doing the MCMC. Okay, so important, the first important one is chi-squared. And if you remember, chi-squared is basically least square feet fitting. And this is a simple form, how it looks like. But visually, this is how it would look like. Imagine you just have a set of data points, these circles here, and then uh, you want to fit a line to them. Uh, what you do then is you get the distance between these points and the line, and you've done it for two different lines here. Uh, and then see how you need to change the line until this distance some of these distances is minimized. Now, that would be this part of it, but what about this? So 
that's the error on the data. Here we don't have any error on the data. So what if we had that? If we had error, it could look something like this. Uh, so you can see that error on some of the data points is larger, but some of them is smaller. Uh, so we, what we do is then weigh the distances based on the error on the data. Because, um, say, this data point that has the largest error bar, it means that we don't have as much information about this data point. So I could make my line move around the lot, like put it here or here, and this data point doesn't care about it, really. It can't differentiate, it's not sensitive, really. But this data point that has the smallest error bar, we need to be careful of this one because if we move our line a little bit, it can be discrepant with this one very quickly. Okay? So, the way we capture this is by um, weighing this distance by the errors. Now, here the errors are all the same, so I take them out of the sum, but if they were different, we could put them in the sum and then have a sigma i. And then another step is what if the errors are actually correlated with each other. And then in that case, you have to take the correlations into account as well. And then you write the chi squared as this general form, which is which includes the inverse of the black space with a little bit So and this delta y is basically this thing, but in uh, vector form. So all the eyes are in here. Alright, so covariance matrix, um, this is like the form that normally when you see a covariance matrix, this is a 7 by 7 covariance matrix, so you have 7 data points and you're looking at uh, their variance along the diagonal and then the covariance on the top of that. Um, so, uh, just take a few, I, can, I don't know, a minute uh, to think about these questions and then we can discuss it. So the question is, what does it mean if data errors are correlated? And where do you get a covariance matrix from? And how do you uh, calculate one uh, once you have some information? So what are the different methods? So and then for this one, first let's, let's think about this one, then we'll go to this. Um, so what does it mean if the correlated errors are correlated? Think about what if the correlation is zero, or if it's positive, or if it's negative. Okay. Right, just take one minute to think about this, and then. Like the the errors are re all related to another parameter that is uh, the same for every other error if they are correlated. So that means, yeah. I don't know if I explained well. <laughs> okay. But so there's yeah. some other aspect that makes them correlate with each other. 
yeah, they're not independent. That's what I want to say. They are. Mm -hmm. There's something else. Okay. So if say if um, um, like point four and three have a uh, high correlation. Yeah. Okay. So what what does that mean? Then? If it's a high correlation, like a positive high correlation, compared to if it was zero, then this one say.
but the error on top of it also correlates them. So it doesn't allow one of them to suddenly go really high, while the other one stays low. If there was like a perfect correlation between them. But normally you don't have perfect correlation, because you don't have perfect correlation, there's still a chance that you might not see it. But if you do loads of realizations, you start seeing that. Okay? And then the question is, where do you get covariance matrices from? And one has ever calculated the covariance matrix or got the covariance matrix from someone? Yeah? Yeah, Python package. That's one way to do it. What did you give the Python package to give you? Like, all the other parameters, like in this case, errors. So I will have Does anyone use like simulations to get covariance matrices? Yeah? So what do you do there? So I have a mean, I have separate parameters, and I call it data vector. Let's say some statistics, let's say fast vector. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do some 10 bins mm -hmm. and values of k. And I have it, let's say, for 10,000 realizations. So I have the mean value mm -hmm. of the 10,000 realizations. And then I have each value for each organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we compute the difference is for every organization. Then yeah. PKI minus mm -hmm. square. And yeah. yeah. And like for every, like if it's just the population, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So if you have um, noise realizations, which may come from simulations, for example, if you have many of them, you can get the quantum matrix from that. So if you remember the equation for variance, this is basically the same, but also looking at the cross variance, which is the covariance between different points. Mm -hmm. So and that's the uh, like kind of definition of covariance, that's where it comes from. But there are other ways to get covariance matrices or calculate covariance matrices. Do you, does anyone else know what other ways there might be? Just like a name. Like, can you get it directly from the data? Have you heard of jackknife or bootstrap? Yes. Yeah, so that you can get it directly from the data. We're not going to talk about how you do that, but just remember that there are different ways to get it from the And there's also a way to get it from theory directly uh, by Knowing some things about your data, like for example, you know, it's far spectrum, uh, there's cosmic variance. Cosmic variance, you can assume like your underlying distribution is Gaussian, then you know, get the four point function, for example, that will give you the variance because it's correlating with the four points instead of two points, that would be the far spectrum. Um, and then you know something about your noise realization, uh, like you know how many galaxies you have. If you're looking at shapes of galaxies, you know what is the dispersion of the shape, shape of galaxies, this sort of thing, and you can add them together and then get a theoretical price. This one in particular was calculated from simulations. Uh, so, so it was using that method that you said. Okay, so. Um, we define what phi squared is and covariance matrix. Um, so we know how to write our likelihood function. And we've assumed that this function because it's a simple and because of central limit theorem hopefully works. Okay? It doesn't always, but well, that's what we almost always do. Uh, okay, so now how do we actually I click this thing. Mm -hmm. And so, if you remember this chi square, we wrote it like this. Covariance, I said, is fixed normally. You get it from somewhere and then you don't touch it. It's just keep it as it is. So you invert it and keep it as then. So the only thing that's changing in this equation is delta y. Y is not changing, it's only the mu that's changing. And mu depends on your model parameter. So what you normally do is that you vary your model parameters, then you see if your data and your model 
are close to each other with the weighting that you introduce, which is equal to this. So you're doing a least square fitting, basically. Okay? And your varying parameters until you get a good, good match. Um, so, but imagine you have 12 free parameters and you want to do this. How would you do it? You say you have you want to do the simplest version, which is you can't do it for every single parameter, value of the parameter because it's infinite, it's these are continuous continuous parameters. Uh, so you have to choose certain values and then that would be your likelihood sample. So you can't get the whole likelihood, you just get a sample of the likelihood and hope that it encompasses most of the information that's So imagine you use a grid sampler. Um, that would be very slow because it would go as n would be the size of your side of the grid, the side of it, and then to the power of number parameters. So it's very slow. And that's why people came up with other sampling methods. The one that we're going to work on is uh, the simplest one, uh, which is called Monte Carlo Markov chain or something like